Good afternoon. Thank you for so many of you coming in from the sunshine. And um, this is the last of uh, my first year of uh, Freshman Music Lectures. And those who've been to previous um, events will know that we've traced music in various ways. Um, its authenticity, um, its analysis, its history, the value of recordings. Last time we caught up with the business of um, the exciting business of how you progress uh, music from its dusty <coughs> library into available edited form for the performer. But for the final lecture, I think it's the one that is most people would consider the most important part of the music process, the actual performance. And so we have two actual performers to welcome. <laughs> Emma Kirkby, <laughs> Jacob Lindbergh. Bravo. <clears throat> And this is not entirely about performing, it's uh, talking as well about performance, the vicissitudes of being a performer nowadays, and what occupies intelligent, famous performers when faced with this starting point of picking music off the library shelf, finding a reference, picking it from the music shop, and settling down to decide, is it for you? Does it fit your programs? What are the pros and cons of this volume you see in front of you? And we will eventually pass around a few volumes so you can see what these particular performers have in front of them. So, um, firstly, when you pick something off the shelf, what do you first look for? Well, if I'm supposed to be singing it, yeah. obviously I think, um, <laughs> is it... Is it my range? Are those words, am I going to be able to get those words across? Because everyone has an effective speaking range. And sometimes you, you very often find um, in the nature of, of, of this music a lot of stuff's for tenor, actually. And tenors can sound so easy and lovely on high notes. And sopranos, they've got a different uh, recipe for them. So I'm always looking for, for finding things that are comfortable for me to speak. And I double check. If, if it looks a bit high, I check various things, depending on, on the piece. I mean, if, if it's a, a piece in several parts, I look at the bass line in case it's got a funny clef, because if, that's got a, if the bass line isn't in the bass clef, it, it might imply the whole thing should have been transposed down anyway. Uh, but if it's a song of, of this type, uh, where you've got the lute part, and um, you, there are different sizes of lute and so on, there are various ways you could, if you still love a song and you want to be able to do it, there are various ways you could wriggle into the right pitch for yourself. But also double check what the edition is, who, who produced this image of it, what were they thinking, Have they, were they thinking of a piano part or something. I mean, just checking really what the provenance of the image you're looking at. Um, if, if, it, if it is obviously from an original um, image, then, then I have to think, okay, that's, that's more or less how it's supposed to look, and either I fit it or I don't. Um, so having decided that it does fit, then obviously I check over I mean, if I know the composer already, I'm going to have a sense of, of how he works. And I'm going to go for the text, because the great glory of the lute is that you can speak with it. And that, on the whole, the level of, 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 uh, um, the, level of the text is very high. It's, it's, it's beautiful, They're often very beautiful words. So, and sometimes you can find out who wrote the poem. There's all that side of things, just, just to check. But in the end, you, you, you have to... Feel if, whether you can live with the song yourself and whether, whether, it's, whether someone like me should, should be singing it, whether the sentiments are appropriate to a woman or whatever. That's with lute songs, with other things, obviously with, with opera arias and that kind of thing. What is the scoring? Who, who else is playing? Is it just strings? Is there an oboe there? I mean, I, I love looking for chances to duet with, with other melody instruments, to be honest. <laughs> that's, that's one of my ways for finding my way through a, a huge bo of, um, volume of stuff that I, that I might want to, to try and sing. Agreed. We'll, we'll come a little bit later to the, to the um, uh, trials and joys of making programmes out of this music, because um, one of the features of earlier and more intimate music, of course, is that it wasn't designed for concert use. We have to invent the format in which you hear it. And whereas the average symphonic programmer can just slap a concerto and a symphony together on the page and say, there's your program, 
or if it's Marley, you just say, okay, Resurrection Symphony, that's it. <laughs> uh, the, the early music specialist has to do quite a mosaic job with a lot of pieces averaging three minutes in length, and you have to construct um, your program from those. But that in a moment, Jacob, from the point of view of the, the lute, do you have an, ad when, you, when you come to look at, at available editions, is it, um, do you find a huge advantage that the lute plays from tablature, um, or most lutenists nowadays play from tablature, a form of notation, not the same as, as piano notation, and therefore you can bypass some of the worst types of <laughs> editing that a pianist suffers a lot from having over-edited um, 18th century music that's been adopted by 19th and 20th century editors. We talked about this last time. The lutenist, I suspect, has a closer and more direct path yes. to what the original had. We live in a curious time just now, actually. Um, we're very fortunate in my generation to have so many facsimile editions available to us. Uh, so we can quite easily uh, get hold of the fa facsimile copies of the originals and even there one has to be careful to some extent uh, and often if there are other sources like manuscripts of the same pieces it's nice to, to double check that the edition that you're working from is the best possible one. Uh, but now what's happened is that because of internet um, and a very big... Uh, community of enthusiastic amateur lute players, they are now putting out all these tablatures on the internet. So as a teacher, I often find people have downloaded these tablatures that, the, that players of, who have not been very clever have <laughs> so been oh putting together. So in <clears throat> fact, um, for the younger generations now, now I, think, I think it's a bit dangerous because these tablatures are coming and they're often um, contaminated, <laughs> shall we say. Uh, but yes, but it, the fact that we can play from the same type of notation that they used then is, is, is wonderful. Can I just tell the story I told you yesterday? I was in Udine with a, um, playing with a, a lute player from Cremona, and we were doing a, a funny Shakespeare mishmash. I sang the Stravinsky songs again. Good. Ooh, is that my thing on? Oops, am I supposed to do No, they do it. <laughs> um, I sang the Stravinsky songs, and so we had... Um, modern wind players and we had a lute and we had a gamba and we had a choir and it was sort of Shakespeare through the ages um, and we had a, an actor he was brilliant and he was reading Italian uh, translations of Shakespeare sonnets and he turned to Diego and said can you find me some music as a background just while I read this sonnet and Diego said ah picked up his iPad put it on the music stand and there was all of Dowland he said, oh, I'll have that one, you know. And, would you like, and he, he, he played one fantasia, no, not that one. And, and, and we said, this thing this big had just the whole library that he could have played from. It was just such a shock to see. <laughs> but that, of course, was, it was the facsimile. That was the original, so there was no problem about authenticity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, seemed, it seems to me a little bit, then, what you're saying is that at least a lutenist and maybe potentially almost everybody can now be their own editor. You, you mm. no longer have to rely on what a professional musicologist has decided to choose amongst varying readings for you and publish in a volume. You can take the raw material. I think at the moment, lutenists probably are used to doing yes, that. We're, yeah. we're, we're, we're Many always, people who yeah. deal in medieval music are used to doing that. Conductors who deal in, in historical performance are getting used to being their own editor. On the whole, the... the the industrial musicians, if that's the yeah. right term for them. Um, the stand, standard <laughs> yeah. symphonic thinking tends to sublet the job of editing to somebody else and the orchestral player trusts implicitly what is put in front of them. So there is there a stage of understanding that has to have been uh, passed through somebody else you trust. Just explain, though, before we go in, into a little music, um, the added complication in your life of having more than one instrument around. <laughs> Emma, Emma has one voice, however you describe it on the programme, it will remain that voice throughout the evening, yes. but you can... Well, the lute is a, is a fascinating instrument and it has a very long history and there are so many different types. And, of course, when choosing a programme, one has to think carefully what lute one brings along. Um, and so I often find myself um, deciding to travel with two. But it is complicated, and particularly if you have this very long instrument that you will hear later, the theorbo, 
the anagram of which is Oh Bother. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, because nowadays, uh, the rules with many uh, uh, flight companies is that anything over 150 centimetres cannot be bought a seat for, although it might actually fit in there. So we have to check them in now. Uh, uh, many loot makers are now making these instruments in which the upper neck actually folds. <laughs> and so there are players who go around with that sort of in instrument. I, I don't, and in fact, for this particular lecture, my theorba, which is made by exactly the same instrument maker as this one, I borrowed because my theorba is at the moment parked in Stockholm. <laughs> <laughs> so I try to avoid to fly with them. But um, when you do, one has to sort out. Um, I have a, an aluminium case specially made for it so that I can check it in without worrying too much. Um, I designed that after a trip that Emma and I returned from um, from, what was it, Poland? Uh, yeah, yes. Poland, yes. yes. And I, I arrived uh, and the instrument had been smashed. Checking it in and it was just broken right off. Mm. So it's dangerous. And uh, So if I can just play, use one instrument, I do. But it depends a bit on the programme. And one wants variety and therefore often I like to have two. We've also had fun with humidity, haven't we? Or lack of it. Oh, <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> we went well, around America with, with, with Jacob's wondrous loot he hasn't got here actually which is, um, goes back, it's, it's, it's belly is original from late 16th century. And well, the whole instrument actually is. It's well, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, it's about, yeah, back mm. and belly. And uh, you take your hygrometer, and you don't take it out of the case unless it shows what percentage? Minimum of uh, 40, really, but it, sometimes <laughs> uh, it go, can go down to 35. I played in 35% humidity, and it's okay. But if it goes below that, I don't take it out of the case. Half the concert halls, you walk in there, and there's about 26. Yeah, so <laughs> they have to boost it. <laughs> okay, on to... Um, the devising of a program from many, many small pieces, which is, um, I think, in most cases, left to the performer. You don't have, you, people won't dictate a program to you so much as ask what your... On the whole, yeah, not, not too much. Which is very yeah. good. Um, as I say, um, it's a tiny pieces, average length, three minutes, how to put them together. Um, take, for instance, this first group. What are the criteria why why these pieces... Well, it's obvious why a prelude begins, and it has to be a prelude to something. Yes, we are lucky that Dowland has written this particular prelude. It's only one. He probably improvised these, I should think. It's nice with a little introductory on, on the instrument to set the, the sort of sound levels. And uh, that particular prelude finishes on a G major chord, which leads us very nicely into the first of the songs. Into, into Go, Go Crystal Tears, which is one of the most perfect lyrics, really, both verses fit beautifully to this quite intricate setting and you'd think it was made for the first verse but the second verse fits beautifully as well. And that's in G minor which about 80% of lute songs are in G minor no, it's actually. it's C minor. Oh, take it off, but, oh, it's got the B flat Ending on anyway. a C major chord then sorry, G minor. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Yeah, sorry. So <laughs> better say it now. No, we did get, okay, we've done yeah, better. We, we got away from G yes, minor more exactly. often. <laughs> And then, yeah, we're going to G minor for Shall I Suit. That's right. Um, but that's interesting for itself, because G minor, um, it suits the lute very beautifully, the way it's tuned. And we might think that all minor keys are sad keys, but actually you can be quite, uh, quite cheerful in a minor key as well if you're a lute player. It's, it's possible. <laughs> and then follow, that's Prelude, Go Crystal Tears. Shall I Sue, Shall I Seek for Grace? Which, yeah, it appears to be melancholy, but it's a, a rather light love song, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, and after that, a, an instrumental piece, proving, I suppose, that song recitals don't have to be song followed by song followed by song. I love to make sure that there's plenty of solos. I, I like sitting and listening to them anyway, and I think it's, um, it's lovely to have the variety of sound. And I think the, the accompanists in this, the people who, who work with singers in this field are fantastic soloists and should be heard. <laughs>
I think it's always surprising how much skill goes into the constructing of sequences like that. They seem to give such a perfect picture of a complicated composer, his various moods, the styles of, of the lute, and so on. And then I know from experience so many ways such sequences can go wrong and simply um, that explanation of key sequences at the beginning, um, even if one is not aware of uh, tonality and doesn't have perfect pitch, you are always aware of the nastiness of shifting um, from one key to uh, a key, a semitone or a tone higher that bears no grammatical relationship to the, the key before. Simple things like that, plus the nature of the words, the framing with solos. I think for a long time the, the world of singing was rather bedeviled by um, what Gerald Moore writes about in his... Um, lovely autobiography which he calls Am I Too Loud? The Life of an Accompanist. <laughs> and he said when he was young, and I, I think we can all probably remember seeing these concert notices, you know, so and so, Elizabeth Schumann, soprano, at the piano, Gerald Moore, and he was always very offended by this, you know, it wasn't even playing the piano. It was, <laughs> so a program that is designed to show that Jacob is not merely at the lute, but... Uh, <laughs> performing on the lute sets the thing um, in a much stronger context of the, boi the voice being one component. Just to be technical uh, about the singing aspect for a minute, um, when people write um, approvingly of the fact that you have founded single-handed a complete school of singing, um, do, you, um, do you take that as a, a compliment, a limitation, a, a um, a, a correct observation, because now I think we're quite used to finding not only Emma's voice everywhere, but clones of Emma everywhere in the early music world. That is a sort of school of production, of thinking, of suitability. I um, would hope, I mean, I think there were some clones uh, early on, because there were all the people in charge of collegiums, in, in, um, particularly in American universities, who'd say to their students, please sing this like Emma Kirkby, even when... And people would come to me for coaching with girls with gorgeous um, olive complexions and warm Spanish-sounding voices, and they were going, eh, and I say, well, where's your voice? Well, I've been told to sing like you, you know. So, <laughs> <laughs> I say, well, you're the lucky possessor of a very beautiful voice. It's nothing like mine. Please use your voice. Sing like me if you want to approach the words in the same way, but please don't try and, and change the, your actual sound. I think that's now gone. I, I think there are so many good new um, young singers around with really individual voices, and, and we can we can sense that they, they are using their own their own sound, and, and that's that's wonderful. I, I think if if you can recognise a person by their sound, if it's if it's if it's within range of their speaking voice, it's often quite a help with this sort of material, particularly. Um, I think the singing. It, it, it does come from, from speaking, and that's how you get the individual sound of your own that's going to work for this repertoire. So if, if there's anything I'm, I'd be very pleased to see more people try, it's, it's really engaging with the words and the embodying them. That's the word I like to use, that it's not just working hard on diction, and, you know, like sort of quiet boys and sticking your mouth out, and all that doesn't help. That, that doesn't actually make it, it, um, the voice come comfortably at all. You've actually you've got to have your whole body. It's, it is, a, it is a, a, your whole body is your instrument. You've got to use your core sound and then let the consonants really have an important role. And that there was a very strong feeling that legato line was so important that consonants should not be allowed to interfere. <laughs> you know, and you, you can't say anything very easily if, if you try and sing in that way. So you, you have to try and get the two things going. You do have to have core sound, you have to have your own sound ringing out strongly. And then you have to challenge it with really consonants that close properly, therefore they open properly, all that sort of thing. It's, it's very, very um, picky. You, 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 can, you can really change how someone gets sing through a line by, by addressing one or two syllables, and it can be quite a liberation sometimes, because actually it's terribly efficient to use the consonants very physically. It saves an awful lot of air. It's like your fuel, and so um, it, it's really worth doing. Do you find that people um, can actually read the words without the music uh, uh, musically yes, yes. and make sense of it? Because I've, I've sometimes been surprised um, in coaching sessions in 
standard conservatoires where most of the singers will be aiming at the operatic stage. Mm. Um, they've gone a lot for range, for vibrato, for sheer volume. And when you say, stop a minute, dear, can you just tell me what the words are of this aria you're singing? And they're a bit perplexed. And, and minus, minus the music, they don't seem sometimes even able to remember the sequence of the words. Yes. And certainly not able to declaim them as though they were poetry, which is, is where most of the music starts from. Well, the trouble is where a composer has, has put some repetitions in, um, which is wonderful in the song, it doesn't sound very good outside the song. And so, yeah, the, the, the singer really has to have a shape, the shape of the poem in their head before they start and see what the composer, what, what was the program, what was the poem that the composer was approaching? What shape was that before he started? And that's very interesting then to see what the composer has, has then done. And I think I have actually found exactly like you that it's incredibly useful and I've, 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 I've used this, this, this um, asking f for the words to be declaimed and I've said and sometimes I, I do have I'm coaching someone who, who has really does know what the words say and has a sense of the poem but still doesn't know how to speak it because they think for singing it, it, it the, the line is so important and I get them to say well you're an actress now you have to declaim you know, go crystal tears that sort of thing and just speak it but with a lot of air going through and sometimes when that works and in Italian restative and so on especially when they really engage with that if they've had quite a lot of vibrato at the beginning which I have never mentioned it, it's gone. You know? <laughs> because actually the way to get rid of the sort of vibrato that's annoying is to have a really good clean um, release into a note. Go, not go. I mean, it's as simple as that, really. <laughs> Let the consonant give you a clean entry and then you can add the vibrato later on as an ornament, but it's not the first thing you see. First thing you hear, sorry. <laughs> Going back to what you said a little bit earlier, you, you encourage them to find their natural voice rather than, rather than try to assume a persona because they think this is correct for, for early music. When you're faced with lute um, pupils, do you still get people arriving nowadays at the lute through a start in the guitar? Because yes. it, used, it used to be quite a bugbear of the teaching of historical plucked instruments that people came at it from... Um, a school completely separated in, in tradition. Yes, that's very normal. So they, they have to be taught not to behave like their natural guitarist selves. They have to make, yeah, quite a lot. How do you detune de <laughs> them, as it were? <laughs> well, the way I, I do, I, uh, often um, the theorbo is a good step towards it because the theorbo players, for example, they used nails quite often in Italy. So therefore, the, the, the big difference between playing the lute in the authentic way is we don't use uh, fingernails, we use the flesh of the fingertips. And that's one of the first obstacles in a way if a guitarist, I, I, I had, had to do that same decision myself many years ago, do I cut my nails off? Um, and that's dangerous for a guitarist. So by playing a bit on a theorbo first where the nails are okay and they get hooked, uh, then one can go to the finer points of, of, a, of a lute, which where their touch is, is very different. Um, and there are a number of other things that um, they need to... One of the biggest concepts, I think, uh, when changing from guitar to lute is uh, when you play the guitar, it's a bit like the legato idea, they're taught that all fingers should sound absolutely equal. So they practice it in that way and they do scales, with, but whereas lute playing is wonderful. I mean, it is actually taking advantage of the hand. We have the captain of the fingers, the thumb, who always takes the strong beat, uh, and then the index, which is the short finger, takes the light beat. Or if you use uh, alternate with these two, there's always the second finger takes the strong beat and the light finger. So there's a natural link between physical movement and musical expression, and 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 that is something that intrigues them actually because it's the opposite of what they've been taught. Mm -hmm. And. and uh, some people just say, no, this is not for me, but others... Of course, the left hand, they've, they've sorted out in their youth, so it's all talk about the right hand, and therefore one can go ahead much quicker with somebody who's done the guitar, although one has to do a certain amount of de-guitarification. <laughs> <laughs> I think this business of using the natural um, facility and differences of, of the body applies to, to many instruments. Absolutely. And has been a little bit denied <coughs> by traditional conservatoire because you practice the piano like mad to make your fourth finger 
as strong as your second finger and yeah. things like this. Um, it was never so in, in the 17th and 18th centuries. It, would, it was admitted that you had good and bad fingers, which meant strong and weak fingers, which gave an automatic inflection to the playing. Yes. Um, just the same as it was assumed when you play the violin that the down bow is strong and the up bow, um, the return bow, is lighter. And that gave the, the um, uh, plasticity to the line that you played. Um, more recent training, and particularly in violinists, Russian training, the Juilliard up bow is several times louder than the Juilliard down bow, I find. And it's so counter to nature that you have to really work on kids who have learnt this style to make a virtue of the inequality. And just while we're on the teaching subject, one other, one other question only, because it was presented to me, interestingly, the other day, um, uh, a boy came who'd been criticised uh, for his playing of a Mozart sonata, I think in some competition. And he came along and said, um, after a, a, a class, is it possible to teach insight? And I said, well, um, why, what exactly are you asking? And he said he was criticised for playing his Mozart technically perfectly well, but lacking insight. And he wanted to know now where he should go and to whom. <laughs> <laughs> Um, although, uh, you know, one despairs in a way at, at being asked the question, what, what do you yeah. face when people say, how can I see into this world of Elizabethan, Jacobean music? Uh, can it be done by teaching or is it just done, done by osmosis and an interest in the entire I think that's, I think area that's the more effective way, obviously, is what people have found out for themselves is always going to go in deeper. Yes. <laughs> and I feel very sorry for your... your Questioner, I must say. <laughs> it's so easy to say things like that about a performance, isn't it? It's so easy to say oh, it lacks passion, it lacks commitment. And you just think, well, how do you, t how, how do you know what's going on inside that performance? <laughs> I mean, especially inside, because that's subtlety, isn't it? It's very difficult. Well, he has to communicate something. So if, if they are saying you are feeling more than you are communicating, yes, this might, that, this might enough, be yes, it. But I mean, yes. that is teachable. You can teach mm. people to bring out what is not like, the same as you can teach. Um, acting expression, uh, when the, the full feeling is, is in there, mm. you can sense, but, but it doesn't, in fact, communicate. But I, I, I just wonder whether insight is something different from just experience or, well, quite. or, I think or it was a, a sense of experiment. It's quite um, a cruel word to use for a, for a young person, isn't it, in a way? But I it was a bit... Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, with that expression, I, I remember vivid, vividly a very, very nice... Um, Italian professor used to live in London when I started and he was so sympathetic and so nice and so helpful and I was singing away my Monteverdi with all the passion I could muster and he said uh, yes it's, it's going very nicely um, don't get much feeling yet you know, I just <laughs> <laughs> but he was right because actually it was all in my head and not in my body so that's really the point you've just got to get your whole body and I think with your young man with his was it Mozart. Was it violin or um, piano? Piano. Yeah. Um, well, I don't, I don't know enough about pianos, but I mean, in a sense, it it is going to be the the, the physical involvement of the body, isn't it? Somehow you've got to give away a bit more and and, and live more dangerously somehow. But it, you, you actually, it's very hard for young people to live dangerously without making a mess, and they don't want to do that, you know. <laughs> well, I think historically is sometimes sometimes um, a help in the, in that sort of situation. One of one of the useful cures, I think, for perhaps being slightly petrified at the modern keyboard is that you've been taught somehow that the instrument you're using is not exactly appropriate to the repertoire you're playing. Mm. And so they're in a slightly frozen state of not wanting to overdo the Steinway ground um, for fear that the uh, purity police will come along and complain <laughs> that they, they've overstepped the mark. Uh, to go then and play on an appropriate instrument where you can really go to its limits, mm. where Mozart in his sonata uses the very lowest and the very highest note, is very good. And the only other suggestion I could make is that he should not only play, um, experiment a little on, on instruments that were rather closer to Mozart's intention, but also play for a sort of setting uh, that wasn't quite so modern concert hall inclined. Mm. So it's the problem, I'm sure, um, you both have of, of setting up um, concepts of recitals and performances in often threatened by buildings that are too big, 
uh, an audience of too many thousand, the need to project to far too many people at once. If he cut down his Mozart to the sound, say, of a clavichord and played for three friends, yeah. you, then that might produce insight, and I, I suspect mm. the same for the, yeah. for the point for you. Presumably, you have to turn down jobs that say, will you sing a Dowd and Lute song unaccompanied in the Albert Hall? Well, <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> I did have a, a lovely person, actually, who came and said, I know you're booked to sing in a really beautiful hall, which is it was, um, in Milford, um, and you're booked to sing in, in our hall, and it's a, it's a lunchtime concert. It's already sold out, and I'm under pressure to move it into the church where you sang Mozart last week, or the, 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 the week last year. What do you think? And I said, it's not going to work. He said, I'm so glad you said that. <laughs> <laughs> he really didn't want to have to do it. And, and I think that there's, you, you can, obviously, you, you do sometimes have to create your own, your own domestic feeling wherever you are and try and draw people in, but there is a limit to how far you can go mm. with that. Well, this is, this is a congenial uh, is. capacity size, yes. I think. So we'll, so we go on to the fuel burger. Shall we? Yes. Mm -hmm. Since you've described the yeah. uh, the o oh bother, yes. uh, <laughs> this might be an opportunity to. Yes, here it is. Um, it was invented in Italy, uh, and it was originally uh, taking a bass lute, the largest lute, uh, and this idea of the extended neck came later. But the main point about the fiorbo is to do with its re-entrant tuning. So the six strings uh, that you play most of the music on, tuned in a so-called re-entrant tuning. The two top strings have been dropped an octave. And then you have just a scale down there um, for the long strings. Um, and uh, the man who invented it um, was Alessandro Piccinini. He, he thought, now how can I make a lute sound with stronger bass? And the first attempt was he made a very big instrument like this. And he had one bridge here and another bridge down here to make the long bass. And that turned out to be impossible to, to play. <laughs> so he came up with this idea, which is impossible to tune. But, uh, <laughs> So what should we start with? So do you want to, should we do the uh, person? Do you come. want to go straight to the... Le leap into it. I think let's just do La Nana actually, shall we? Yes, yeah. okay. Yep. So we're actually going to start with sort of what might be the absolute minimum experience of the Theobo, the first few bars. It's, it's the most amazing bass line ever. If Jacob shows you, you'll, see, you'll hear how extraordinary it is. This is, this is this is La Nanna, yes. This it just use guess that's the bass line is it. It's a lullaby. It's the Virgin lulling Jesus to sleep and saying, Please you must sleep now and you mustn't cry because there'll be plenty of reason to cry later. It's, it's a lot of irony, and it's you know it's 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 enchanting and 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 bleak and and beautiful. It's also a lullaby. It takes a long time, and I'm afraid we have very naughtily give, we're giving you a kind of impression of it. We've made a little tuck in the middle. Um, <laughs> and actually, I think the thing about lullabies, I don't know if anybody's ever found this, but uh, I was given a, a lovely CD of beautiful lullabies by a young friend. And each one was two minutes long, and then there was another one. And I said, um, couldn't you put them on a loop? Because actually, if you really want to get a baby to go to sleep, you have to repeat things. You have to hear the same thing many, many times. Otherwise, they won't. They'll get woken up by the new one each time. <laughs> In this case, um, the, the, the hypnotic thing is the bass line. But it is... Um, it, it's a proper lullaby in that, really, um, by the end, the baby has fallen asleep, as you will hear. And she says, having, having mused about what's going to happen and the fear of things, she then says, well, at the end, now he's asleep. What do I do? All I can do is just watch and, and uh, revere him. <laughs> Dormi, dormi, 
questions you will need a microphone to speak into which is available somewhere is this correct yes here yes, comes right. uh, we had one question one here. yes there's a gentleman there. how do you go about ornamentation um, I think one learns that by osmosis as well, actually. Ornamentation. Um, I think as a singer, I mean, th there are treatises, one or two, which have page after page how to ornament a tone, how to ornament a third. And you, you look at all this and your eyes glaze over. Um, and you can have a go at it, but actually, I've, I don't know, the cheating thing in a sense is just to listen and hear what, uh, what instrumentalists do, what, what happens, how the composer's ornamented his own repeats. I don't know, it sort of soaks in. I also find that, I mean, like with folk singers, I think, that melodies, they, if you sing them over, your t you find yourself singing a melody, it starts to change in your, in your subconscious. And I find that I wake up with ornaments sometimes. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm working on a piece, and, and I, I just sing it, to, I find I'm singing it, and I suddenly realise that there's, there's been a change. I think it's, it, 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 it's very difficult to, to know where to start. You just have to jump in and hope for the best, really and listen a lot and, and just imitate until, until things don't fit, as it were. And also, I mean, I, I do think you have to have a lot of nerve. If, if, if you're not prepared to get egg on your face, you'll probably never be able to start. <laughs> <laughs> I had somebody in a class recently who refused, although it was meant to be training in, in baroque ornamentation, she refused um, to take any risks because she said she was a perfectionist. And she wasn't going to do anything oh, in case it went wrong. Yes. So this is, I thought this was absolutely the wrong way to approach ornamentation, that you, um, you surely go in, in for it uh, in a not too public uh, setting yes. to begin with, as you say, with the, with the risk of falling flat on your face. The thing face. that frightens us is the tunes, isn't it? How to, how to make an amazing tune where, where there was something else before. But Caccini, who, you know, was the 1601, was the sort of the real first person to put it all down and, 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 and show singers and how, how to start. 
I mean, there, there were a few other things, but he, he's so practical. I mean, he's got an ornament for the, reta the secret retaking of the breath. I mean, how wonderful is that? You know, <laughs> you, you've got, you've got the, the long note before the cadence. You're supposed to do something with it. And y you're running out of breath anyway. So you go, ah, ah, you know, that's, that's the sort of person I want to be. <laughs> <laughs> but even he, he begins with how to ornament a single note. You know, you can do the messa di voce, or you can do the ah, or you can go ah, you can do the esclamazione, or the messa di voce, all these different things. Then he starts telling you about tunes. So I think in a way, to, to look at the absolute basic thing first, and see how many ways you could, you could feel a note, and, and why are you going to ornament that note, well, because of what, what it's saying. You know, if it's ice, you're going to sing it one way, and if it's flame, another. So a lot of ornamentation actually comes from the words and from speaking the words one way or another. Th there may be a bit of clever composition involved, and probably there won't be, but it, I, I still think that ornamentation is, is much more than just notes you can read on a page. Mm. It's, 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 it's all sorts of unnotatable things as well. I think sometimes having, having a sense... Um, a sort of analytical sense of what is ornamentation in, in the music as written. Yeah. Because mm. not, ev not all the little notes in what you just sang were your invention. Mm. They, mm. Were, they were there, but often people think ornaments are something uh, that are not on the page, when in fact the composer often provides you with a piece mm. containing ornamental passage work, which can give you a, a great clue Absolutely. as to what more you might do. Yes, and, and the yes. Stuff. But I, I quite agree, springing from the words and being extempore. Mm. It's a very funny situation nowadays in Baroque uh, music, I find. If you do a handle opera, the one thing that requires endless rehearsal and is liable to go wrong in every performance uh, will be those cadenza moments, which were in the past traditionally the places that were done extempore. Mm. And nowadays, because people come along with their fully written out cadenzas and um, have certain you know, requests that they make of the conductor and the orchestra to do things not as notated, they take all your rehearsal I time. have to admit, that's my rule of thumb, actually. If I baffle the continuo with a the cadenza, then I give it up, find another. <laughs> <laughs> if, 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 I can, if I can deliver it so they know where I'm going, then that's all right. You know. <laughs> another question from someone. I note the, the, the importance you place on uh, engaging the whole body while singing, and also that you've been singing sitting down. Um, uh, while while uh, a parent singing a lullaby over a cot wouldn't be very soothing for either party, do we know historically whether people singing to the lute did sit or stand? Um, I think both, actually, probably. But the nice thing about the lute, partic particularly with, well, the theorbe is a little bit different because it's, it can be louder and it can go into the background more while people do histrionic things. As you say, the lullaby was a special case in a way. But with, with the ten-course lute and the beautifully composed accompaniments, not, not, not um, Jacob's version, but Dowland's version of something, I love to sing on the same plane as the lute. I, I don't want to be coming from a different place. Um, so I, I will always try and get that, which means sometimes if we're in a big church where I know I've got to stand, because otherwise I, my face won't be seen, and I really don't think I can communicate without that. I will sometimes stand and, and, and beg for a, 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 a little pedestal podium for the, for the lute player so that then he's raised up and he's still on the same level as when I stand. So I, I, just, I like to keep that plain level, if I can, with, this, with, with the really um, beautiful duo um, style of, of, of the, the, the lute song proper. When it comes to continuo parts, it's a little bit different. Um, and the Thielba Thiel is such a lovely round sound that, you know, it, it can, um, I, I, I could stand and yell and still um, um, in no way overbalance the Thielba. So there's more freedom there. Uh, for, for, to, to demonstrate this, but maybe these, 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 mm. um, there are facts, the facsimiles yes. of the original books that people sang from show that the, the format of printing uh, this is for a yes. Dowland song was, was four people round a table with the this, music this, this facing This is what you just heard. Directions. So Jacob and I would have been sitting this side of the table and we'd be playing, I'd be singing and he'd be playing from there. And then if you want the four part version, the tenor would sit here and the bass there and the alto here. It's really <laughs> economical and lovely for an ensemble. <laughs> Thanks. 
maybe one more question be one before some yes. final final music there because we come up to yes gentlemen <coughs> Thank you. Following on your remark about taking risks, I'm going to take a risk actually uh, in this uh, company of people who are so great in uh, earlier music. But it does seem to me that uh, sometimes great composers like Bach, for example, Beethoven particularly, Mozart to some degree, were almost writing ahead of their time and actually might want to have broke, broken from the constraints of the more limited instruments that they had. I'm not suggesting that your instrument is limited, but um, early pianos and so on. So it seems to me that uh, one needs to be a bit careful about uh, complaining about a too schmaltzy uh, interpretation of some composers, because that's what perhaps they were reaching for. I don't know. That's a bit of a risk in mine, I think. <laughs> I think the risks that, that we're asking composers, uh, performers to take um, are construed from a performer's point of view, probably should stay within the boundaries of the composer's world. But it's true that composers press the envelope. Um, but there's no composer I know of who ever wrote for a non-existent instrument, for instance. So they, they wrote for an instrument or for voices available to them, stretched them to their limit, and when that limit was reached, the maker took his cue and expanded the instrument, made, and they said, great, I can now uh, write my piano sonatas bigger and bigger, I can now... Um, ask for a voice that fills a larger and larger. Or perhaps, um, whether you can backdate that tendency and say that before they reached that, that state of having it, they were um, in their imagination asking for that sort of thing is um, philosophically very difficult to, to um, support, I think. And certainly from the performer's point of view, um, unless the composer has given um, adequate instruction for performance. Most composers do, do give pretty good instruction in the, in the, the page, increasingly so as music um, went through the 18th, 19th century. They told you what, what they wanted as well as what they didn't want. Um, whether we should, one should overstep those marks um, is a very moot point and comes down often to question of taste and how far you, you feel um, you know, like American symphony orchestras used to feel. One size fits all. My feeling about music is that one size rarely fits all. And um, as Emma was saying, to get to the gist of a work, um, it is unique in its requirements and its instrumentation and its words. Um, if you can capture that and still give a full performance that, that doesn't seem to be lacking anything, I think that's a considerable achievement rather than uh, poaching on the territory of another composer and saying, <clears throat> this Dowland song doesn't seem to be going very well. Let's sing it as though it was Tchaikovsky and see, <laughs> see whether it blossoms. I think you would probably hit more mines in that minefield than you would solve the problem. I don't know, mm. what do you think? Yeah, I think Staying within, think within the bounds. Put it beautifully. <laughs> I think we have time since we're nearly up to our mark. Yes. Our closing, maybe a closing piece. And as I say, this is the last <clears throat> lecture of this set of six. Next year... We start on a <clears throat> um, similar form of programming called What Makes a Masterpiece. I forget the exact date when we begin, but no doubt it will all be on the internet and, and published. And again, because I think this is a very nice format of having live musicians on this stage, I will try in the next six lectures to have at least three topics for which we can have uh, live illustration and question and answer with performers, which after all is the, the business of music making. And for the, for the moment, thank you very much to Jacob and to Emma for this final program this year. Thank you. We'll do, it's very brief but great fun, and it's Purcell playing around with the ground bass, which sort of came from Italy, so it's quite a good move from the, from the Merola Nanna in a way. Uh, he's at the other end of the century, of course.
and he's famous for his grounds. And this one's, um, it's, it's the Italian Chacona anyway, so it's very cheerful. It's a poem by Abraham Cowley, and it's um, probably not suitable for a woman to sing, but who cares. Um, it's someone who has set about seducing someone and thought he'd made it, and then found that honour was getting in the way. <laughs> so then he thought, okay, well, those things, um, you know, they, they, those things are... are um, uh, they, they, they move in daylight, those things. So why don't I try at night time? Maybe I'll get you. <laughs> she loves and she confesses to There's then at last no more to do Happy works entirely done Enter the town which the Right. 